Welcome to the best of the Geek Speak Show. Hey gang, what's going on? So we're going to take a little break. Well, maybe not that little, but a, a break for the entire month of August. And usually when we do best of shows, we play back issues, if you will. Just previous episodes of the Geek Speak Show. Not going to do that this time around, though. Going to play some original content for you. Remember last year when we took a break, I played Fred Green Hodges. The Cleansed audio drama. Pretty cool. You guys sent me a lot of emails and saying, yeah, we love that. Do it again. Well, I'm not going to do it again. You guys can go to thecleansed.com to uh, catch up on that or listen to some some of the new episodes if you are interested in that. However, from Christoph Leputka, who is actually, actually a friend of Fred Greenhodge, he has, he has an audio drama called The Leviathan Chronicles. Season 1 just finished not too long ago. Season 2... Just kicked out. I believe they're on their third episode as we record this. Spoke to Christoph by email, and he gave me the permission and the okay to go ahead and play season two, episodes one and two for you guys as uh, for the first two weeks of uh, of our break. So this is called the Leviathan Chronicles, season number two, to science fiction audio drama. Pretty cool, actually. It features. I would say over 60, if not more, actors, voice actors, professional sound effects, original music soundtrack. It's, it's, it sounds like a movie, quite honestly. It's pretty cool. One of the reasons why I want to play it for you guys. So for those of you who have not heard of the Leviathan Chronicles, go to our guest link section, leviathanchronicles.com, if you want to go there directly. I have a link to the website. You can download the episodes. You can read all about the the story of the Leviathan Chronicles and, who's be, and the voices behind what you're about to hear. And you'll also get some bonus stuff in there, like pictures of some of the ships and the submarines that are featured in the uh, in the Leviathan Chronicles. I'm going to play season two for you guys, episode one this week, episode two next week. But for those of you who have not heard Leviathan Chronicles season one, here is a quick recap, followed up by episode number one of the Leviathan Chronicles season two. The Leviathan Chronicles Season 2 The season thus far 1,000 years ago, an alien spacecraft crashed into what is now modern-day Norway. Containing two alien explorers from the planet Sorax, the ship was discovered by a Viking medicine woman named Evangeline Liefrik. In exchange for nursing the aliens back to health, the Soraxians modified Evangeline's DNA and altered her body's chemical structure so that she could absorb the energy from a starstone, thus perpetuating her life indefinitely. In order to escape the religious persecution of the Middle Ages, Evangeline sought to create a utopian society as far away from the corrupting influences of mankind as possible. With the assistance of the Seraxians and their alien technology, Evangeline was able to build a city within a gargantuan cavern at the bottom of the ocean in the Marianas Trench. Soon she brought others she deemed to be enlightened to descend from the surface and join her immortal community. She called the city Leviathan. But after suspecting that the alien's presence on Earth was less than benevolent, Evangeline secretly incarcerated the aliens within Leviathan, thus assuring a constant supply of the rejuvenating starstones needed to maintain immortality and keep the aliens from returning to Sorax. Over the next several centuries, life within Leviathan flourished as more immortals joined the community. And soon, their isolation and longevity allowed them to create technological and artistic advancements that far exceeded any of those developed by mortal men on the surface. But as the potential threats to Leviathan and mankind grew, Evangeline began to militarize more aspects of life within Leviathan. Discord soon infected the city, causing more of the Leviathan citizenry to resent the restrictions Evangeline was forced to institute. New Leviathan members were more likely to be soldiers than sculptors, and regular visits to the surface were severely curtailed. A violent rebellion finally erupted 70 years ago within the city, as the rebel leader Senshin led hundreds of immortals out of Leviathan to establish a new life on the surface. Ascension planned to debilitate Evangeline by infecting her with a deadly retrovirus. But in the chaos of their departure, the pathogen was leaked into the general population, killing thousands of innocent immortals. 
Now on the surface, without Evangeline to extend their lifespans, the rebels need a new mechanism to perpetuate their own immortality. Using stolen DNA from Evangeline, Senshin and his rebellion embarked on a genetic breeding program to create a clone of Evangeline. After many failures, the program produced Mikhail and Orsor, a young doctor working at Rockefeller University in New York City, who was Evangeline's genetic clone. At roughly the same time as the rebellion, the United States established the Central Intelligence Agency to provide national security intelligence to senior U.S. policymakers and law enforcement agencies. Within the CIA, a highly clandestine division known as the Black Door Group was created with unprecedented autonomy and pervy. Black Door is comprised of 20 doors, with each subdivision possessing a specific area of jurisdiction. In time, door number 12, led by Jason Sterling and his lieutenant, Whit Roberts, became aware of the Immortals' existence and deemed their superior technology and wealth to be a threat to US sovereignty. Sterling and Roberts, along with the Leviathan traitor Banu, are contacted by the imprisoned aliens and recruited to aid in their liberation from the Immortals. In order to free the aliens, they are told that all Immortals must die. Seven years ago, a Starstone was delivered to Leviathan by a modified submarine called Hai Ten Shi. But the sub was intentionally sabotaged to maroon the Starstone away from the Immortals, but within the psychic reach of the aliens. The Starstone was then used as a transmitter to amplify a deadly signal that killed only Immortals. Many members of Leviathan City and rebels on the surface were killed. But Black Door realized that even with Evangeline dead, the Immortals could still perpetuate their immortality through her clone, McAllen Orsall. A plot to kill McAllen is hatched, and Whit Roberts attempts to apprehend McAllen in New York City. But Senshin is able to intercept in time, saving McAllen and taking her to Sutton Manor, the secret rebellion headquarters. There, Senshin reveals that McAllen is indeed immortal and part of the Leviathan community. He sends her on a mission to Alaska to retrieve the key to unlocking her full immortal potential. In Alaska, she meets Jeffrey Tully, captain of the Hail Mary, a treasure hunting boat, along with his first mate, Oberlin St. Clair. Together, they find the key in the frigid waters off Alaska, but Black Door captures Oberlin St. Clair, and Tully and McAllen are rescued by immortal rebels Anton and Othello. In an effort to neutralize Black Door, Senshin sends Tully, McAllen, and Anton, along with the rogue immortal Harlequin, to infiltrate one of the hidden research facilities of Nankatsu Industries, a global high-tech conglomerate with shadowy ties to the Black Door group. While breaking in, the team discovers a transportation portal called the Keyhole that instantly teleports the team to the Nankatsu Submersible Proving Grounds at 19,000 feet underwater. There, they commandeer one of the deep water subs and after narrowly escaping a deadly robotic drone, find themselves on the doorstep of Leviathan City at the bottom of the Marianas Trench. In Leviathan, McAllen is embraced by Evangeline, and she quickly adapts to life within Leviathan, taking her rightful place there as an immortal. Harlequin, however, is treated with suspicion due to slanderous lies spread by Banu. At the same time, on the other side of the world, Whit Roberts is trekking through the Himalayas to reach a secret cave hidden near the peak of Mount Shenlong in Tibet. He is joined by another Black Door agent named Mai Li, who works for door number three, as well as Oberlin St. Clair, who joins in hopes to be reunited with his best friend, Tully. When Senshin learns that the aliens that granted his people immortality had been imprisoned on Earth by Evangeline for almost a thousand years, he agrees to help Whit Roberts and the Black Door group. But now the alien breakout has occurred. By releasing a deadly computer virus into Leviathan's civic AI, Banu has thrown the city into chaos and placed the blame squarely on Harlequin, who quickly flees Leviathan to save his own life. Whit Roberts opens a portal from the alien's prison within Leviathan to Tibet in order to bring the Syraxians and Banu to the surface. But back in Leviathan, Tully and Anton attempt to intervene, engaging in a deadly fight with Banu. Tully jumps through the portal, reuniting with Oberlin in Tibet. When Evangeline learns of the plan to rescue the aliens, she rushes to their prison but is dealt a near-deadly blow by Banu, and now hovers between life and death. Anton arrives at the prison just in time to save McAllen and Evangeline by executing Banu. 
In the chaos, the two aliens rush to jump through the portal, but Tully recognizes their threat and destroys the keyhole before they can complete their journey. The aliens' whereabouts are now currently unknown. The Leviathan Chronicles Season 2 Chapter 26, The Castle Maneuver. The portal. We've got to close the portal. Evangeline! Get down! Evangeline, Get down no! The queen is down! Repeat, the queen is down! Get me through to internal security. Initiate Eclipse Protocol at all access points. And bring the city to security level diamond. What's her latest condition? Critical. She's been unconscious for more than four minutes. Erratic breathing and her pulse rate is dropping. She's gonna die? She's got a basal or skull fracture and possible subdural hematoma. We have got to get her a norepinephrine or a dopamine IV right away. Alert the hospital. Get all traffic on Tweedle Boulevard clear. Tweedle is still impassable. But we have to use laughing. Medpad just arrived at the cathedral entrance. Lift her slowly and for God's sakes, keep her neck immobilized. What are her life signs? BT is falling. 70 over 40. Hang on, Evangeline. Please, please, hang on. There's so much blood. This can't be happening. Move! Go, go, go! Almost seven miles beneath the Pacific Ocean, the unthinkable had occurred. Doesn't look good. Over 1,000 years of collective immortality was now threatened by the sudden assassination attempt of Leviathan's leader, Evangeline Liefrich. Her betrayal by Banu, her second in command, had been violent, with him overpowering and hurling her headfirst into the stone walls of Leviathan Cathedral with supernatural force. After killing Banu, McCowan and Anton sprinted to Evangeline's side and desperately applied emergency care to keep her alive. Guards and medics flooded the remote antechamber, hidden deep within the sealed corridors of the Leviathan Cathedral's sub-basement, where Evangeline had secretly been keeping the two Seraxian aliens prisoner for the last millennium. They rushed Evangeline's failing body to the medpod waiting outside the cathedral, as her life hovered on the brink. The screaming medpod raced along the streets of Leviathan, as citizens exchanged frightened looks from the sidewalks and parks. Drive faster! Damn it! How long until we reach the Leviathan meds? Leviathan was now a city under siege, as Harlequin had driven a stolen cave hog through the main city thoroughfare of Tweedle Boulevard, demolishing up its cobblestone streets and smashing through several buildings. Moments later, massive explosions were heard emanating from Leviathan Cathedral, as many wounded soldiers were evacuated on med pods. All of this occurred while various elements of the civil infrastructure was failing due to the virus Banu had planted within Leviathan City's AI. News of the city being placed on security status diamond had reached Lorelei and Maestro Viberucci in their studio. Soon the sky above pulsed with red and white flashes indicating an emergency situation of citywide calamity. It called for all citizens to evacuate the streets of Leviathan and report to their homes or nearest collapse center. Not since the Great Rebellion had this alert system been utilized. Incidents of such lethality weren't supposed to happen within the utopian confines of Leviathan. The med pod pulled into the emergency entrance of the green cylindrical med tower as the hospital staff rushed to Evangeline's body. Several dormant keyhole portals stood nearby that were used to quickly admit immortal patients from the surface. But right now, the entire resources of the Immortal Hospital were being utilized to save one single person. Over 12 hours passed, and Anton exited one of the doctor's offices in the med tower to walk towards McAllen, who stood to meet his gaze. Tell me. Well, it's not good. Evangeline's in a coma. What's the prognosis? Well, the doctors say we won't know for a few days. Won't know what? Whether she lives or dies. Aunt Hun, she can't die. What will happen to Leviathan? She can't just... Oh, God. Come here. Anton took McAllen in his arms and she gripped him tightly. What about the Asian woman? Her name is Miley, but we don't know much more about her than that. Her identity's been scrubbed at the highest level. Maybe Black Door. Right now she's in deep shock and pretty much catatonic after watching her father get decapitated by Evangeline. The doctors are looking after her, but they're keeping her in a separate wing to be safe. Why so much death, Anton? 
Evangeline created a paradise under the ocean. Why? Why? Why did all of this have to happen? Why is she going to die, Anton? Don't say that, McCallan. We don't know that yet. The what about using a starstone? They have the power to heal almost anything. Can't we use it to reduce the swelling in Evangeline's brain? The med team has already sent the honor guard to scour the cathedral to try and find one. But the only starstone within Leviathan was the one that Evangeline used to re-energize the immortality genes within the citizen's modified DNA. She kept it hidden in an unknown chamber. Only she and the citizen being communed would enter a keyhole that would transport them from the main hall of the cathedral to the communion chamber. We don't know exactly where it's located. The catacombs beneath the cathedral are designed to be like a labyrinth, well suited for keeping secrets. Maybe not. We certainly discovered Evangeline's secret. I mean, my god, she kept the aliens prisoner for a thousand years. That seems horrible and and not something the Evangeline I know would do. Why? Why would she have done it, Anton? I don't know. She must have had her reasons, but right now they're locked away in her unconsciousness. So what do we do now? Well, I guess that's largely up to you. What are you talking about? You. You're the only person on Earth that can transmute the energy within a starstone. It's up to you to perpetuate our citizens' immortality. Leviathan needs you. You'll be looked to as its leader. Rumors have already permeated the city about your existence. <laughs> no. You can't think that Leviathan I- Leviathan needs its queen. Its citizenry is bound by a common goal of developing social and technological advancements for the benefit of mankind. But there's a deeper bond. The desire to perpetuate their own lives. Mankind, even the immortal ones, you know, are still bound by the greed of self-interest. Evangeline may have denied it, but it's true. What do you mean? People want to live, McCallan. That's what drives their interests far more than any political proclivities. There can be only one queen of Leviathan. Of course we could hold a general election for a new leader of the immortals, but it ultimately couldn't keep the society cohesive. Not forever. And forever matters to us, McKellen. Why? Because a new leader couldn't guarantee to perpetuate the immortality of the citizenry. Evangeline created a harmonic civilization within Leviathan because there was no denying that we all needed her. And there was no questioning her authority before Sension started the rebellion. And there will be no questioning of you. Leviathan needs you. Needs me to do what, Anton? Magically make everyone live longer? Perpetuate the immortality of Leviathan's citizenry? I don't have any fucking idea how to do that. McCallan. This isn't my world. I I don't know how to use a starstone. You're wrong, McCallan. I watched you do it. It's in your genetic code. You were literally designed to do it. You shut off the rogue starstone, sending that damn signal killing off the immortals on the surface. Anton, I didn't know what I was doing. I you just... You looked rather proficient from where I was standing. And if I recall, that was right before you were driven into unconsciousness and almost died. Whether I live or die doesn't matter. Leviathan needs you, McCallan. Without your help, its population will die off. You have the power to unite Leviathan under your rule, more so than any other human being. Like you said, I'm not human. Nonetheless, you're the only one, McCallan. Well, it's irrelevant at this point. Until we find a Starstone, I'm not able to commune anything for anyone. With that I agree, but we're doing everything we can to find it. That's not true. What? How so? I can think of two other beings that know where we can find Starstone technology. Really? Who? Elgar and Kirana. Evangeline kept two aliens prisoner in Leviathan for a thousand years. The two of them disappeared through a keyhole and are now somewhere on the surface of the Earth. And we have to find them. Mount Shenglong, Tibet. Where are the aliens, Senshin? I told you, I know how to find them, but we need to get back over the Nepal border to Kathmandu. From there, I can arrange transport back to New York so that- The aliens won't trust you, Senshin. You and the other immortals betrayed and imprisoned them. They trust Black Door. We were the ones trying to rescue them from Leviathan. All they wanted to do was get home. I had nothing to do with their imprisonment. I would have freed them myself had I known. Convenient sentiment to have now. When we find the Seraxians, we'll do it together. I know teamwork is a profanity for you. I'm warning you, Senshin, that if you- Damn it, I can't get a signal here. We need to walk to the cave entrance where we might get a better shot at the satellite. Come on. The four men walked towards the cave entrance. Senshin walked confidently in front, while Tully and Oberlin tried to stay close, not liking the fact that their backs were to Whip Roberts. Tully shivered violently as the group grew closer to the mouth of the cave and the Himalayan temperatures that surrounded the mountain. Jesus, I'm, I'm really cold. Here, here, take my jacket. 
I've been here in Tibet for a week now and I know how cold it can get. Jesus, are those the only clothes you've got, Tully? Obelan peered at Tully, who was still wearing his jeans and a salty squid t-shirt that was a gift from Angus McKay. Obelan was still dressed in the alpine gear Mai Li had procured for him before she, Obelan and Whit Roberts left Lhasa for Mount Shenglung. The weather within Leviathan was kept comfortable at 70 degrees, despite being seven miles beneath the frigid, cold ocean. Tully had been strolling on its streets only two hours ago. Now, the icy Tibetan air chilled him to his core. He rubbed his arms furiously to generate heat and yearned for the fuzzy pink sweater that he hated so much, but it kept him deliciously warm. Oberlin. Oberlin, we need to get back to Leviathan. I left McAllen there. I, re I really screwed up, man. She- No, I know. My Lee just leapt through that, that keyhole thing. She's in Leviathan too, and I just, just let her go. I should have gone with her. I should have tried to go after her. Oberlin. We gotta get out of here. These guys are crazy. They've got some war brewing. Keep moving and shut up. The cave entrance is just ahead, Sension. We still have two enforcer drones that can transport us. Correction. You had two enforcers. What are you talking about? We're not alone. Someone's here. As the four men walked up the stone steps of the lower starstone chamber, the intense smell of ash and char filled their nostrils. Small fires burned in the corners of the cave, casting a macabre light throughout the entrance chamber. Bits of black blood could be seen streaked along the cave walls that combined with the smell of singed metal released a noxious odor to the room. Half of the metal girders that were built to reinforce the cave when the Chinese stole the starstone now hung, broken and mangled from the ceiling. Scoring and fresh bullet holes lined the cave wall near its entrance. The entire front section was completely deserted. Impossible! Who the hell did this? Yeah, I think I'll go down and repair the keyhole I blew up. The enforcers, they, they must be standing guard outside. I'll tell Get them. Get Wait, Roberts, this is Black Door 20. Doorlock protocol has been initiated against your division. This will be your only chance to surrender. You are surrounded. Doorlock? Doorlock? Panic instantly swept across Whip Robert's face, and his movements suddenly quickened and sharpened. He scanned the antechamber, urgently searching for the one item that he needed desperately. Where the hell is the damn briefcase? Damn it! I need the fucking briefcase. Uh, I think I saw it over there. Whit Roberts sprinted to his cherished briefcase. He punched in the code to establish communications back on the station. Jason. Jason, do you read me? Jason Sterling, come in. This is Sterling. Whit, I, I read you, Whit. Over. Jason. Jason, we lost the package. I repeat, we lost the package. My god. Whit, we need to get them back. We need to find the aliens. If we Jason, don't, I understand, then... but we need to institute field fire procedures immediately. Our team is under attack by Black Door 20. Door lock protocol has been initiated against us. You need to move, Jason. Your position at Acheron is no longer secure. Door lock? That's impossible. We need to find the aliens first, Wit. If they escape without I have a plan, help. Jason. There's a lead in New York City that will allow us to reacquire our targets. We need to rendezvous at the station. I repeat, rendezvous at the station. How soon can you be in position? I still have Tanaka's son, Toshi, in custody. I can be at the station in 72 hours. You have to hurry, Jason. Door lock is coming. We are under attack at the communication base. Do you copy, Jason? Whit! <laughs> Sension leapt forward and grabbed Whit by the waist. The aftershock reverberated through the cave, throwing the briefcase high against the cave ceiling, smashing it. it to pieces. This is door lock, Agent Roberts. Surrender is your only option. What the hell does door lock mean? It means that surrender is not an option. Weapons, quick, what do we have for weapons? I still have my Walther, but the 50 cal in my assault suit is still non-functional. Just got my Glock, but I also have some nerve gas canisters within the transport pods down below, outside of the cave. I know a little kung fu. If I can get to the pods, we stand a fighting chance of incapacitating the enemy. You're out of your mind. They obviously killed your enforcers. What chance do we have? You can't go out there, Wit. Smell the fucking campfire inside this cave. We can't stay here. Sension followed Wit as they both edged cautiously closer towards the cave entrance. If you make out the size of the assault team. Whit pulled his coward Genesis binoculars out of his backpack and peered outside the cave looking down. Five. Well armed. 500 meters below us at high base camp. They're carrying XM8 assault rifles and thermobaric grenades. Looks like they've erected a small porta bunker with God knows what inside. They've been waiting for us. Can you see the pods? Yeah, yeah, I can. There. Whit trained his binoculars on the transport pods that the enforcers had carried up the mountain. 
Rather, he observed what remained of them. The first one resembled a burnt shell of itself, with black smoke leaving long trails of soot into the alpine air. The second looked heavily cracked and dented, but still fundamentally intact. They found them. One of them is toasted. The other one, I, I can't tell. Fuck. There's no other way out of this cave. Keyhole's been destroyed. There's no other exit. Okay. Listen, I can get to the second pod. I have to. There's no other way. We need to create a diversion. Sentient. If we lay down cover fire... Cover fire? Are you out of your mind? They have us out, man. Out of So help me God, you better not back out now. If you give me up, your rebellion will die. The aliens will be found, and when they are, your immortals will be the first people they'll kill. Now you need to step it up. This is your last chance. Listen to me. I'm going out there with or without your help. I need you to lay down cover fire. Wait, this is crazy. I'm never going to- Ascension. If the aliens are found by the wrong people, it could mean the end of the world. Now take the damn shots and get Black Door to take cover. Your Black Door. Not anymore. Without another word, Wit spun around and headed out of the cave entrance into the icy winds. He carefully made his way across the narrow ledge that led downward to the large pitch where the transport pods lay. <sighs> Orville and Tully, search the rest of the cave for anything you can find that can be used as a weapon or explosive. We need anything you can find. Ascension sprinted to the cave's edge with his Walther drawn. Wit was already halfway across the narrow ledge before Ascension fired his first shot. At a distance, he knew he had little chance of hitting one of his targets, but he hoped the gunshots might draw enough attention away from Wit to buy him some time. To his surprise, all five of the assailants retreated behind the Porto bunker, buying Wit another 30 seconds to make his way across the ledge. Sension's relief quickly faded to horror when the Black Door assault team re-emerged, holding a two-person shoulder-mounted rocket launcher. Shit! They're reloading! Wit! Wit, get the hell off that ledge! They're gonna... Almost there. Hold them off for one more minute and tell... Wit, the ledge won't hold! You gotta get off before they... Wit! Ascension was thrown off his feet and flung backwards Ugh. ten meters into the cave. Rock dust and smoke filled the air and the shockwaves left everyone's ears ringing desperately. Oberlin and Tully helped Ascension back to his feet and then sprinted back to the cave entrance. The assault team at the base of Mount Shenlong was laser painting the opening to the cavern and was firing modified soldier-launched Hellfire 3 missiles designed to incinerate both rock and human collateral. In normal conditions, the missiles possessed a deadly accuracy, but the light fog of falling snow interrupted the laser targeting, causing the Hellfire to strike 30 meters off its intended target. The results were still devastating. Wit! Wit! Wit clung precariously to a tiny outcropping of rock 20 meters to the right of the cave opening. Blood was visible from numerous cuts on his face. The small rock ledge that led to the outcropping had been incinerated by missile fire. Whit Roberts was trapped. He's a sitting duck. They'll nail him in the next shot. Couldn't have happened to a nicer guy. They'll have another round ready to fire in 30 seconds. We can't get to him from here without ropes. Well, look, we tried. We have to do something. Tully, my assault armor, grab the chest unit. The what? The chest unit right there. Oberlin, help him. Tully and Oberlin ran over to the neat pile of components that comprised Sension's vigil assault armor that he and Nathaniel had used to paraglide uh, into Mount Shenmue. Uh, heavy. Uh, must be 300 pounds. Tully and Oberlin strained to lift the chest unit of the vigil armor a few feet off the ground. Sension deftly slid to his knees underneath the raised torso and slipped his head and arms upward into the unit. Wait, hang on! They're reloading! What the hell are you trying to do? You can't move in that thing! Firing! They're firing! Jump, Wit! Jump! The Hellfire missile screamed out of base camp and raced towards Wit. For God's sakes, Wit! Jump! Wit desperately looked left and right for any place to run or jump from the precarious ledge to which he clung. Sension raced as fast as he could to the cave entrance. Jump, Wit! <laughs> the two falling bodies raced down the sheer face of the mountain. Wit flared his arms and legs while Sension streamlined his body to accelerate closer to Wit. The free fall through the frigid air caused frostbite to develop on the tips of Wit's ears as the side of the mountain raced dangerously nearby. Come on, come on! Ascension stretched further to lower his aerodynamic profile, which gave him just enough momentum to finally catch Wit. Ascension crashed into his body, slamming Wit's head against the cold ceramic of the assault armor. A four-inch gash opened just over Wit's left eye, causing him to quickly fade into unconsciousness. Better this way. Less resistance. Got to grab him tightly. We'll be pulling eight or nine Gs on deployment. Ascension quickly locked his arms around Wit's chest and wrapped his legs through Wit's legs. Now! 
The round glider exploded and fluttered before rapidly expanding. He could feel two ribs breaking inside Wit's chest cavity, and Senshin felt one of his own dorsal muscles rip under the shock-loaded strain. Gunfire still echoed throughout the valley, but none of the bullets touched the two men. The powerful Himalayan winds quickly grabbed a hold of the large parachute and whisked it east around the sheer face of Mount Shenlong and out of sight of the Black Door assault team at its base. Against all odds, Senshin and Whit Roberts escaped. Commander, they've drifted to the far side of the mountain. I can't get a laser lock from this angle, but if we advance to the south ridge, I might be able no, to... No, no. Even with the spider rifles, it'll take us ten minutes to traverse the high pass. Damn it, we lost them. All right, I want a full sweep of the cave they exited. Maybe we can find some other clues as to what Whit Roberts' next move is. Let's go! Back in the high cave of Mount Shenlong, Tully and Oberlin stared at each other. What the fuck just happened? I... I think Mr. Senshin just jumped off the side of the mountain and grabbed Whit Roberts in midair. Does he think he can fly? Like Jesus? Maybe. I've seen some pretty crazy things over the past few weeks. Yeah, you and me both. Are those other guys still shooting at us? I don't know. You should go look. Fuck that. You go look. Fine, we'll look together. But for God's sake, let's stay low. Tully and Oberlin both got down on their hands and knees and approached the edge of the cave. The warmth generated by the heat of the explosions quickly faded to the bitter cold of the alpine winds. Despite Oberlin lending his jacket, Tully shivered uncontrollably. There, down to the left, they're advancing up the mountain. What the hell are they doing? Several hundred feet below, Celeste Harris and her D-20 Black Door assault team fired their spider rifles, running fixed lines to the various ledges and outcroppings of rocks. Their motorized belay devices pulled them at high speed up the face of the mountain, avoiding miles of switchback trails and preserving their oxygen and strength. They're coming towards the cave. You think they're the good guys or the bad guys? Oh, look. They have rocket launchers and aren't afraid to use them. How good can they be? Come on, we gotta get back in the cave and find some place to hide. Hostile! I've got one! No! Two hostile! One of the members of the D-20 assault team swung inward on a fixed line to kick Tully squarely in the chest. The rest of the assault team quickly flooded the cave. Two armed men in white snow camo body armor raced past Tully and Oberlin with rifles raised, sprinting deeper into the cave. The other two followed tightly behind and threw Tully and Oberlin against the side of the cave. The squawking and chatter of radios echoed off the ancient cave walls. A woman ran inside, holding a Sig Sauer P226 in each hand. She sprinted in, stopping two feet away from Tully and Oberlin, and roughly pushed the barrels of her two guns against each man's temple. Don't fucking move. Please, we're, we're not with those other guys. We... Who are you? Who are you? Oberlin St. Clair, and, and that's Jeffrey Tully, and... and... we surrender! The thick darkness squeezed against his fragile body, and then stretched its fingers out beyond all of eternity. Every space between his eyes, his fingers, and the atoms that comprised them was filled with this inky blackness that had never been pierced by a single particle of light. He had never known an abyss as alien and hungry for what remained of his soul as this one. So after eight hours, when the pitch blackness began to soften ever so slightly into the deepest shade of cobalt blue, he dared for an instant to remember his own name and who he still was. Soon, the dark blue melted into ever lighter shades of azure, turquoise and sapphire. He blinked his astonished eyes repeatedly as he saw them there in the distance, shimmering rays of sunlight, sunlight that could only be breaking through the water from the surface. Sunlight. Oh, sweet goddess, sunlight. I made it. Surface. Goddamn surface. I'm alive. I'm still, I'm still fucking, fucking alive. alive. Harlequin burst through the surface of the Pacific Ocean and disconnected the pressurized helmet of his exposure suit, oh. allowing the cool salt water to splash over his face. The form-fitting rubber seal around his neck kept his suit from filling with seawater. He leaned back and let the sun warm his face as he floated gleefully in the flat seas. Sharp light reflected off the gentle waves kicked up by the western breeze blowing across the Philippine Sea. I did it. I'm alive. I can't believe it. I, I escaped. I... Harlequin stopped his train of thought and gently swam himself around awkwardly to spin 360 degrees. His initial thrill of survival was quickly short-lived. He was now floating alone in the middle of the Philippine Sea.
The Kuroshio Currents has probably pushed me more than 60 miles northwest of the Marianas Trench. Think Harlequin. I've got Guam 250 miles to the east and the island of Yap 150 miles to the south. The problem is I'm drifting further away from both of them every second. At this rate, I'll wash up in the Philippines or the Ryukyu Islands of Japan in 10 days' time. Terrific. I'll be dead from sun exposure and dehydration, but I'll have reached mainland nonetheless. Harlequin leaned his head back and searched the sky for the sun. The bulk of his exposure suit made all movements cumbersome, and any swimming at all was difficult. He felt like a fat navigation boy bobbing helplessly in the ocean. He clumsily swam himself around to find the sun sitting well below the midpoint in the western sky. It's September now, so I probably have another four to five hours of daylight. After that, no one's going to see me in the water. It doesn't give me much time. Harlequin reached his right hand to his left wrist and pulled back on the release lever, removing his left gauntlet. He repeated the process on his right side and watched both thick gloves fill with water and slowly fall downwards into the blue abyss. With the dexterity of his fingers now available, he examined the small ring on his right pinky finger. The ring featured a round onyx crown with a tiny scrimshaw inlay of a cross within it. He twisted the top of the ring right and then twisted left while pulling up until the top of the ring opened like a clamshell revealing a small protruding nub of amethyst embedded inside. Please, please. Harlequin pressed the nub downward and watched the tiny jewel flash twice brightly and then fell silent. And now we wait. It's going to be a long night. And the night was indeed long. Harlequin had never felt so alone in his life. A school of half-sleeping pilot whales skimmed along the surface, and the phosphorescence of the algae bloom of the open sea kept the worst of the evening's gloom away. But the night still felt eerie and deadly, and every brush against his leg made Harlequin jump with fear of a predator hunting him from below. If another day passed, Harlequin would begin to become seriously dehydrated, with his head and hands exposed. And there was also the ever-present fear of sharks. The sharks hunt at night. This damn night won't ever end. Harlequin had no watch, and on this moonless night had no way to determine what time it was. He merely bobbed in the water helplessly, waiting, urgently scanning the star-filled sky for the slightest sign of dawn, and prayed to his goddess that protected him that these waters weren't haunted. There! there. The sun! The sun lives! Lives again! Oh, oh, thank you! Thank, thank you. you! But soon, as the sun rose, the heat of the day beat down on Harlequin's exposed face and head. He could feel his lips cracked and burning, and the metallic taste of blood dotted his mouth whenever he moved them. He kept looking up, pleading with the sky to reveal his hoped escape, but soon stopped as his neck was too burned to sustain motion. The salt water alternatively cooled and stung his skin. In his desperation to escape the sun, Harlequin collected bits of seaweed to spread over the top of his head, but the bulk of his deep-sea exposure suit still restricted his movement, preventing him from shielding himself in any way. I can't. Ah, uh, this damn heat. He continued to search the skies anxiously, trying to locate his intended route of escape. His eyes burned from the relentless glare off the sea, and soon he just closed them and let his body rise and fall with the waves. Maybe she's not coming. Maybe Eve just took the apple for herself and walked away. But then, he heard it. Before he could see anything, he heard the distinct sound of the atmosphere being ripped apart at over Mach 7. No other aircraft on Earth could make that sound. Yes. High within the stratosphere, the narrow-pointed craft banked hard left and entered a flat spin, turning like the minute hand of a clock. The plane rapidly plummeted downwards towards the sea. As it descended further, Harlequin could see the jet-black craft was an elongated delta-wing plane with three round pods underneath its body. When the ship came within a thousand vertical feet, the three massive hover fans exploded into life, arresting the rapid descent and stabilizing the aircraft in a perfectly horizontal position. With one final burst of thrust, the Condor came to rest gently on the surface of the Pacific Ocean, a mere 30 feet from Harlequin. Along the body, just over the wing, a seamless hatchway opened and slid backwards into the body of the ship. A small, African-American woman stood in the doorway, wearing tight black cargo pants and a white tank top. The woman said nothing, but just stared at Harlequin. Well, Harlequin, look what the cat dragged in. You have been listening to Season 2 of The Leviathan Chronicles by Christoph Leputka, 
To listen to the entire first half of season two right now and get exclusive storyline, purchase the director's cut of season two at leviathanchronicles.com. For more updates and news, find us on Facebook and Twitter. Thank you for supporting us, and thank you for listening. Told you all it was good. That's season number two, episode one of the Leviathan Chronicles. You guys can go to leviathanchronicles.com if you want to go there directly. Go to our guest list section. It's on there for you. You can uh, listen to episode one. You heard a recap right before we started. Find out more about the story. See pictures of the ships and uh, all kinds of cool stuff. You can also order season two, the director's cut on CD, which includes... A, um, some bonus storylines that will not be included in the podcast. So if you want to get some exclusive bonus storylines that will not be included in the podcast, you won't find them on the website. Again, go go to the website and order Leviathan Chronicles Season Number 2, The Director's Cut. So thanks again to Christophe Laputka. That is uh, episode number one. Next week, we will do the Leviathan Chronicles Season 2, episode number two. So come on back next week and... Well, I, I was going to say we're going to speak more geek, but you're going to hear more Leviathan Chronicles Season 2 exclusively on the Geek Speak Show. <laughs>